It sounds like a new gin, but today we're going to take a look at a dry hole. What is a dry hole? Basically, it's when uh, an exploration company drills uh, an exploration well and it doesn't find anything. So basically, it's dry. There's nothing there. It's something that's very, very common. We drill more dry holes than we actually find oil and gas. So as an industry, hundreds of millions to billions of dollars are spent each year on dry holes. So it's worth knowing about. We put a video out a few months ago which looked at the uh, pre-drill prospect and the plans for that well. There is a link below if you want to go back and have a look at that. Since then, DNO, the Norwegian partner in the drilling of the well, came out with a press statement. The well was drilled to a total depth of 16,500 feet, encountering two Jurassic sandstones, but wireline logging indicated no movable hydrocarbons within the sandstones. So there is the press release. And uh, well, strictly, Edinburgh then was not a dry hole because it, it implies there were some, some hydrocarbon shows. But we've seen these things uh, described as a technical success in the past. But if you, um, if you can't actually go ahead and make some money from a discovery, then it really hardly is a, a commercial success. And not something the investors will be terribly happy with. So why make a video about a dry hole? Well, the general public may not realise that most exploration wells are indeed dry holes and that the industry spends millions, hundreds of millions to billions of dollars each year on drilling dry holes. Why is that? There are many reasons why a play or a prospect when it's drilled may work or why it may fail. There tends to be a number of components that we look at as geologists, trap, source, migration, reservoir and seal. And we're gonna go and look at these each individually. Now, for it to be a success, they all have to work. We have to score 100% anything less than 100%, and it's what we call a dry hole. So we're gonna use the Edinburgh well to illustrate the challenges facing explorers. We did not have access to the pre-drill risk analysis for the, the current well operator, Shell, and the current partnership. However, um, there are some publicly available reports, mainly from relinquishment reports, and we're going to use those to, to give a flavour and an understanding of why prospects don't work. So first up, we're going to look at TRAP. Now, this is a map of at the uh, at the top of the the reservoir and this is the uh, the top jurassic reservoir now this is the outline of the prospect here to the east you can see that it's getting deeper and deeper and deeper and likewise down here to the south so it's a combination uh, trap here a structural trap what Pharaoh said about it was that, um, and Pharaoh were involved in this license in the past, Pharaoh now a part of uh, DNO, but uh, they said that was uh, there was absolutely full of every confidence that, uh, that in the mapping and that this was a, a valid trap. Um, likewise, Maersk Oil, who subsequently were in one of the licenses over this uh, over this prospect, they said a robust dip, fault, and salt-related closure. So the feeling was that um, very very high chance that this was going to work on the trapping me mechanism. If we next look at the source and migration. Well, it's not just about a source rock because you can sit with source rocks in your hand for, uh, for for millions upon millions of years, and they're not going to get mature. So what we need to what we need to establish is was this organic rich shales were they, were they actually deposited and were they subsequently heated up to sufficient levels of maturity that they expelled oil and or gas? Well, when we look at that, Pharaoh said oh, there's a ninety percent chance that the prospect should be charged and uh, that there were potential migration routes demonstrated on seismic it's simple to charge the jurassic and i would agree with that they, they did suggest that it might be a little more difficult to to actually uh, charge a triassic reservoir because it's stratigraphically deeper um, however um, a very very high chance that it would work and and Maersk too well they came along and said well you know edinburgh is surrounded by a mature hydrocarbon kitchen the charge route is short with no major barriers. And again, it does look from a source and migration that this one should have worked. So next we come to the reservoir. 
And if we look at the reservoir within the Edinburgh region here, you can see there's a stacked sands. There's potential for sands in the, um, in the very latest Jurassic. There is the Fulmar. We've got sands in the uh, Colovian Bajocian. And underlying that, down in the Triassic, we've got the uh, Joanne and Judy sandstone. So lots of potential sandstones within the sequence. Pharaoh said, well, you know, there is, uh, there is good chance of success in both the Triassic and Jurassic. But they said, well, we can't actually map the reservoir from nearby wells. And uh, the Pentland, which is Middle Jurassic, could possibly um, have have some issues. Maersk again kind of uh, made an assessment. Maersk Oil and said no direct wells to tie into the structure. Now the press release says, well, you know, the well encountered two Jurassic sands, so this worked. We don't know the quality of these sands at this time. We'll have to await the the well being released into the public domain for for further scrutiny. Certainly sounds like there were sands present in that. And then finally, there is seal. Well, the seal here would be a multiple one. If we look at Faro, 70% uh, chance it would work. Salt seal demonstrated by uh, Jasmine and clearly mapped. Fault seal likely to have shale in hanging wall. Overpressure analysis indicates considerable column could be retained. Now against that, there are indeed um, overlying accumulations above the Edinburgh prospect in the form of the Flindra and Cordor fields, which had to be charged somehow. And could it be that the Edinburgh prospect had actually leaked and that the oil had made its way up into these uh, younger and shallower features? Maersk oil, top seal, salt seal, fault seal and dip closure all required. So they were looking at it uh, re requiring a number of things to work. Main risk is the structural complexity forming the lateral seal to the north and west. So really, the north and westerly regions here, would they actually work? The top seal was felt to be robust. Uh, certainly, uh, the fact that uh, the Flinder and Cordor shallower oil accum accumulations, um, possibly not the sort of gas condensate that we would see leaking from an underlying reservoir that's at a very high level of uh, maturity that may have been charged by very, um, uh, very high, late mature source rocks in this region so again uh, a feeling that there was a good seal in the region now what is the overall risk well the overall risk that um, explorationists put together is a multiplication it's a, it, it's of, of the trap risk the source risk the migration risk the reservoir risk and the seal risk and overall, rather than talking in terms of risk, we actually talk in terms of a chance of success because ex explorationists must be optimists, but they also must be realists. Now, there is an added complication, and that is that though we may actually find oil and gas and they, we may actually have a success, we really don't know how big the discovery is. And uh, to actually go into that in some detail, it, it would actually take another video to explain. Now, what was the overall chance of success? Well, when Merce did the uh, study back in 2016, they came up with a chance of success of 36%. Faro, back in 2016, their assessment was there was a 44% chance of success. Now, we don't have the details, but current operator Shell announced a 29% chance of success pre-drill. Put another way, there was an expectation, 71% chance of failure. And that's what we have to uh, to work with. But the prize at Edinburgh was potentially enormous. There was a range quoted of anywhere between 100 and 675 million barrels of oil equivalent potential. Now, of course, now that value is zero. It isn't a discovery and it's not going to be developed. So there are no barrels of oil come out of there. So what does this remind you of? Well, it uh, it looks very much like high stakes uh, gambling, doesn't it? And and in a way, it is. All the best technical work in the world doesn't really guarantee uh, uh, success. So let's have a look at um, where the Edinburgh prospect fits. And to, for this, we're going to go to our trove analysis of every single prospect that we uh, can find in the public domain. And we've got thousands. And you can see here we've we've actually shown the the geological chance of success from less than 10% to 
indeed over 90% quoted. These aren't our numbers, these are numbers that are quoted in open source documents. Now, this is the uh, the band 29% chance of success. This is where Edinburgh sits. So it is, uh, there are a number of them, um, you know, 268 that we have in our, in our database. Some of these numbers up here, they do look hugely optimistic and many of them, uh, many of them are, but there are some cases where, you know, we have a down dip, um, down dip oil discovery or gas discovery. And these are, these are risking the, the attic volume. So there's a very high chance for, for some of those. Um, so we have those in the database as well. But if we look at the prospect size, you can see that we have lots and lots of prospects that are actually very, very small, less than 10 million barrels, over 580 of them. But as we go up through here, you can see that the field size is getting very much larger. Now, Edinburgh, although there's a range quoted, we can see that's one of the, uh, one of the bigger prospects uh, has now been drilled in the Northwest Europe region. So this is a plot of the, the geological chance of success. So this is 100% chance it's going to work, 0% chance it's going to work. And these are the pre-drill assessments for all the prospects we have in the database. And then we have plotted that against the recoverable volumes. Now, we generally would use the sort of the most likely, the P50 or the median volumetric assessment for any prospect. There are ranges quoted, and in the case of Edinburgh, uh, we can see that the range is anywhere between 100, and then it would actually go off the graph here up to 675, so it would be somewhere along here. But at the chance of success of 29%, this is the sort of band and area where Edinburgh would sit. Now, anything up to the northeast is is very, very attractive. So Edinburgh looks to be one of the better prospects. So what failed to work at Edinburgh? Well, we will never know for sure. A single borehole, though it goes down to 16,500 feet, it only measures eight and a half inches in diameter. So it's a very, very narrow borehole that we drill in a trap that measures something like 40 square kilometers. So we have to extrapolate from the results of, of a very, very small data set. Trap almost certainly present, source, highly probable at these depths, that it would be mature, that it would have expelled hydrocarbons and migration. Hard not to imagine uh, there's certainly lots of, of focus in the region that would actually bring hydrocarbons from the kitchen up to this prospect. Reservoir, well, the fact that it says no movable hydrocarbons, does that imply that uh, the sands were tight? Were they low porosity sands? We don't know, but there was a reservoir. There were two reservoirs quoted. And in terms of seal, well, where would the failure be? The side seal, the top seal, the seal against the salt, which we regard as being highly likely. Salt is a, is a world-class sealing lithology. But it's one of these, perhaps it's the, uh, the seal. We can only speculate. How much did it cost? Well, again, we can only speculate. At the time of actually putting this video out, the, the, the rig is still on location. The abandonment of the, the well is still ongoing. All we know is that it will have cost tens of millions of dollars. And for all that, there really is very little to show. There's nothing, there's no oil or gas or condensate here to go on to develop. And this money will have to be written off. It was worth drilling. It was a good experiment. It was a good test, but unfortunately it hasn't worked. So what are our conclusions? We're unlikely to hear very much more about Edinburgh. We will get some more information when the relinquishment report is published in, in the future and released. But most exploration wells do fail, even in a mature basin where the, uh, the subsurface is relatively well understood. Were Shell and partners unlucky at, at Edinburgh? Well, the odds were always stacked on a dry hole outcome. However, if you don't drill it, you won't find it. So we see that it was actually a, a worthwhile and, and a great well to have attempted. Do you like this style of video? Let us know in the comments. We can produce others to explain the oil and gas business. Well, thanks for watching the Edinburgh Dry. We've lots more videos coming up, so look forward to seeing you back on our channel shortly. Bye for now.